Carla Falava Coco Fam. Um, today we're joined by legendary K1 Pride and UFC fighter, King of the Walk Off Knockout, the Super Samoan himself, Mark Hunt. Ladies and gentlemen. No one had seen that type of fighter before. Mark Hunt went on to complete the biggest Cinderella story in sports history. You know, I'm one of the best fighters in the world. My job is to go in there and hurt you. Why would I be afraid of anyone? Your doco and what it's about. Pretty much is, is basically about my life's journey up to this point in time, about adversity, about overcoming adversity, pretty much about um, life in general, you know, as a Pacific Islander or as a New Zealander growing up in South Auckland. Why did you think it was important um, for you to be able to sh um, share your story? Well, I wrote the book, um, you know, I, uh, I've said it many times, you know, when Vanessa you know, this publisher, I think she's from Hatchet. She's, um, she kept calling me, you know, um, she said to me, Mark, you know, you can help others with your journey. And I've always been about trying to help others. You know, I grew up not being able to help my siblings, being the youngest, you know, um, piece of shit father. And, you know, not, I'm not blaming them, my mum or dad, because they probably had the same sort of thing happen to them. But I was the first person to stand up for injustice. <clears throat> and it's because of that for me, because I never could help my sister and my brothers. Um, yeah, because in the, um, both in the doco and in your book, as you said, you really share how much of a traumatizing childhood and even into your teen years you had. Was it hard for you to open up about? Well, it was because I, I didn't really remember a lot of my childhood because, um, you know, um, as I found out from the counselor, because I've been uh, going to counseling for a long, long time. It's, um, you know, you live in the third, in the back part of your brain, um, which is the part, of, uh, the, the fight or flight part of the brain. You know, when that part of the brain's on, the other, the normal part, the other two parts of the brain don't work. So when you, you know, when I first met this, you guys, you've been living in your, um, you've been living in the, the back part of your brain for four years. So, you know, for me, it's all, it was always about, um, what'd you say? Um, violence and, and, and that sort of stuff. Cause I was always scared as a kid growing up. And that's pretty much, uh, why I didn't remember a lot of the stuff with my childhood, but um, my older sister did. I wasn't scared of anyone, but my dad. Yeah, my dad was such a wanker, because he was good at beating me up. And that's probably um, why I'm pretty resilient. When you first started talking about it and opening up in the book and also through the doppel and stuff, did it feel like it helped you as well? Being able to... Yeah, it still does, yeah. Of course, yeah, it helped me a lot. But I still go to counseling. I've just started going to... Uh, Hit my first therapist also, you know, my first counseling session was with my ex-wife, um, Julie, and I didn't even know that, you know, we used to, you know, um, be together, we didn't have a TV, but we used to just uh, uh, counsel me, well, not counsel me, we used to just, I just tell her stories and we used to just talk about everything and, and me not even realizing that was my, my start of my counseling um, with her. So, um, you know, even still to this day, I still go to counseling to help me with a lot of issues that I do have because Coming from, you know, like a, a troubled past, like with a, probably a lot of kids at that age and era and time in, in, in South Auckland, um, the, the repercussions of it all, it, it, it's, you know, you don't realize you're not normal until you meet someone that's normal. So you don't really realize how bad you are until you actually meet someone that's normal and she actually cares about you. And and this is how I started with my counseling and how I started, you know, okay, I've got to go to go and help myself and fix myself to be better. Cause you know, although we're, we're, we're divorced, uh, well, we're split up, we're, we're still best of friends because of our children and businesses and stuff we got. And um, I don't want to, you know, um, continue my life in that struggle. I don't want to be, um, to be that, uh, you know, because that violent person that, you know, fighting said, no, I can't. And I don't want to be going back to, you know, turning on a dime on anyone. Uh, you know, I have children now, I'm a lot more calmer than I was before. Um, but, you know, counselling has always helped me to, to, to grow as a person. But um, to set an example for my children, that's one of the main things, I, I, and to have a better quality of life. I, a lot of things come in my life and that I get upset about, but, you know, I, 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 I don't ever want to cross that line, because like I said, I came from a, a, a bad past, and I don't want to be staying in a bad past. I want to go from a negative to a positive, positive always. Yeah, and with 
with the doco and and also your book you go through like um your amazing fighting career with some iconic fights and stuff like at the time was fighting your happy place or just something you felt like you happened to be good at i i never wanted to be a pro fighter never never at all i you know my my father was just good at beating me up beating us up to be honest and um you know the care made me a resilient person i started off as a as a as a criminal and started doing bad things when i met some other criminal friends and you know um i could have been a, a gangster or you know um but i'm a gangster now in a different way i'm a gangster because i do things for the positive i don't do things for bad i i you know i could have been in jail i could have done time or more time for a lot of other things but, you know everyone knows in their heart whether they know what's right or wrong when they get to a certain point in time in their life you know, fighting was was uh, what was, was what God gave for me as as my my lifeline. To be honest, you know, fighting saved Mark Hunt from continuing to be that person. But you know, at the end of the day, all I was doing was surviving a shitty childhood, like the rest of my siblings, probably like the rest of South Auckland or a lot of the people back in that area. To be honest. Yeah, and and I'm sure your story has been um, really inspirational for people from South Auckland and, um, and even our Pacific Island community. So towards the end of your fight career, do you think you lost your love of fighting? Yeah, I lost a long time ago with fighting. I mean, I, um, you know, like I said, as a kid growing up, I, I couldn't help anyone. I, I couldn't even stand up for myself, to be honest. But as an adult, you know, I'm the first person to, to be up and I'm for fighting if it's a proper cause. So with K1, the same thing, with Pride, the same thing. And now with UFC, it was the same thing. You know, you, you um, you know, I'm not going to sit down or go to the back of the bus. You can't tell me that I cannot do things uh, or what you're doing is right. You know, uh, I couldn't help my siblings, but I, I can help myself and, and those, especially with this lawsuit, um, the, the fighters coming through, you know, with, with the, the equality of um, with the, the steroids and with these cheating little rats. It, it, it annoys me about these, these, these shortcut takers and uh, this is where it's, it's come to, and I, I lost the love for fighting um, because of that. I even went to a sports psych about it, and it's like, why do I keep uh, losing fights? You know, and you know, the psychologist first says, well, what happens when you when you get a fight? First, it's fight week. First interview I do, I'm I'm, I'm bagging, you know, a UFC. You know, and I'm working for them. <laughs> Not that I wanted to, but um, you know, um, and. And that's what happens, you know, when times get tough in fighting, you know, you've got to, you know, you become that person, you've got to dig deeper. When times got tough with, with UFC, I didn't even want to, you know, like, uh, you're not getting a drop of my blood, you know, you don't deserve, you know, to have my blood, you deserve to pay me what you owe me, and that's it. I'm not going to give you any more of my blood, and what I, what I made the mistake of doing was, you know, not fighting for my fans. But, you know, I, I decided to you know um to fight in a different way this is a different fight that i have with this, with this lawsuit and and it not just benefit benefits me but it helps all those fighters in the future with um with steroids and cheating i mean in any other sport they they look down upon it i mean do it in bodyboarding do that shit in bottom because you're, you're you're fighting with weights and shit you know not with combat sport being the underdog uh, and, and doing this standing up or something because no one else would do it i was like i can't believe no one else has said something about this shit I've gone to despise cheaters and steroid users, so I'm going to do something about it. This is such an unprecedented thing. Here's a guy competing for an organization that he's actively suing. This is not normal. Everyone who ever just never got to be the man, he just made it possible. Mark Hunt changed the martial arts landscape forever. When we were watching the doco, like, the, your um, request for the cause that you wanted in your contract, like, it seemed totally reasonable. Yeah, it's not like I asked for 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 the money. I mean, give him, you know, don't take, don't, don't give me any money. I mean, don't give me the money. Just, you know, can I get a clause in my contract so I can, so I can make this an even fight? That's the last fight I even care about. To be honest, I think my career is, is uh, you know, is minute compared in comparison to this. You know, it's not just my fight. It's not, it's, it's not just my fight. This fight, it's just, it's everybody's fight. To be honest, I mean, look at what everyone's going to deal with these days. I mean, and. I say it all the time, I mean, in society, if someone does something wrong, what do they do? They get punished. You know, as a kid, I grew up, I did things wrong, I got punished. When I realized it was wrong, but what do they do in business when they, they, they don't get, they don't get punished, they get big lawyers and they try and screw you. Yeah, I heard you had the interview with Ariel Hawani last week. 
and you were talking about the Ali clause and why it was why it's important for you to win this fight against the UFC um, for other fighters as well. Can you explain a bit about what the Ali clause is? Yeah, so there's two lawsuits. My personal lawsuit is against steroids and these shortcut takers. But I um, I joined the class action with the other the, the other guys, John Fitch, um, Kung Lee, and all those, you know, Baron Rivera. With the, with the Ali Act, um, it's, uh, it's 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 for fair pay. These um, these fighters um, with the UFC, they're not they're not employees. They're subcontractors. You know, there's a lot of ex fighters that um, I have have injuries from work from UFC, and they can't. You know, they have to go for me to pay for it all. But the truth is, that's that's an issue that uh, it's a work issue. But the the thing is, they're not they weren't employees then, they're, and they're still not employees now. They're subcontractors. So um, the Ali Act is in boxing. So when they make it to the top, you know they get fifty percent of the revenue. If you're the world champion, you fight for that title. The Ali Act is Muhammad Ali. He, he's a uh, you know the greatest boxer of all time. They say so. But for me, he was a great man, not because of his boxing prowess, but because of what he stood for. He stood, you know, he didn't go fight a war because he was a slave in his own country. For me, that's why he was the greatest. You know, the, the world champion box, you know, Joseph Parker, you got uh, Tyson Fury, you know, Deontay Anthony, all these guys, when they make it to the top, they're set for life. You know, they're giving money away. They're doing things like this because they don't have to worry about the companies. With the UFC, they're getting, I think it's 16% of the revenue. So, you know, some of these guys, I mean, look look at um, Francis Nagano. He's arguing, you know, even before him, Stipe was complaining about money. But Francis Nagano right now, as the world champion of UFC, is getting five to 500 to 600,000 US dollars. You know, my last fight five years ago, I, I got $950,000. And even that was a rule. And I, and I didn't even have the belt. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's five years ago, and you, you can't tell me that the, the, the times have not changed from the from the viewership of people watching the sport. It, it's a joke. And so, how is it for you? Like, um, it must be taking a financial toll as well as an emotional toll as well. It has. It, it's taken a a massive toll on my family, um, myself. I, I didn't realize, you know, what what was I actually getting into if I premeditated this whole lawsuit and then suing. And doing this, like I said, I didn't realize anyone no one had done this before in the sport. What I was standing up for was, I didn't realize it, it was huge. It's, but but the thing was, it was the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. You know, I, I couldn't just sit there and and keep taking it. So yeah, it's, it's taken a financial toll, you know, um, um, uh, physical. I had to, you know, take, you know, I mean, I had to go see counseling a lot for this sort of thing. I, I started uh, on the diazepam just to help me relaxed because I didn't know what I was, you know, I couldn't sleep properly sometimes because, because, uh, you know, I was getting, I couldn't breathe and I was like, what's going on here? And the, and the couch said, well, you're having a panic attack. Do you have like support or is, does the counseling and um, therapy help you through that? Yeah. I mean, again, counseling, and I mean, you know, when I separated, I was staying in Newcastle for the last couple of years, but uh, through COVID, but I, you know, I'm back here with my ex and just, you know, because she's helping me a lot with, with, with how I am at the moment. Um, it's really expensive to, uh, you know, stay apart. Um, um, it's been, it's been, a, it's taken a lot of toll, to be honest. I mean, I only had a, a boxing fight in five years because I got blacklisted by the UFC, to be honest. I was asked the other day, why don't you, what would you say to young fighters coming through these days? Oh man, get a normal job. Or if you want to be a fighter, if that's your goal and dream, if, if you think you're a circle and fighting's a, a square and you can, you know what I mean? Go and look at other companies, you know, PFL that Ray Seffel's running, um, Bellator, some other ones, you know, maybe something, maybe they're different. I mean, I can't speak on them because I never was a part of them. I can only speak on the UFC. With the documentary in that um, coming out and you um, speaking about this, do you think it will help or hinder your case against the UFC? To be honest, I mean, I, I have no idea well, you know, I wasn't allowed to use any UFC footage or anything ever. Well, but the thing is, I, I, how could it hinder my career? Uh, how could it hinder my case with the, with, the, with the lawsuit? I mean, you're talking to someone that hasn't done anything wrong here. Yet I'm the one here that's lost income for six, five, six years. I'm the one that's lost my career. Those years I can never get back. Um, I'm the one that's sitting here and I'm fighting for 
uh, are something that, that, that you know, that I, I have done nothing wrong here. They're the ones that have done anything wrong. And if you had watched the appeal, the, these judges looked at them like, what is this even doing here? You also touched on, on getting ripped off through your career by managers. I mean, when you went through gambling and blowing your money and stuff, were you able to get help or like mentors on the business side of things? Did you have anyone yeah. who was able to help you with that? You know, with rugby and rugby league, they have ex-players that go and help others. Mm. With uh, with uh, with fighting, who did you see before me? There was David Tour, there was Ray Seffel, there was there wasn't many people before me. You know, I went to see Kosazu and this team a long time ago, but never got any help. You know, I never got. Um, so that was like I said, one of the things I wanted to do was was help others. You know, see, talk to them through their careers, and making the mistakes that are there, not make the mistakes that I've made, you know, learn from, from others' mistakes, not your own. You know, what goes from one part of your life comes out the other part of your life. So oh, when you were saying that you didn't have anyone to give you advice on like the financial side of things and the, on, bus, on the business side, what advice would you give up and coming fighters on the business side? Oh, um, you know, um, get the right management team around or the right help, or the right people around you. You pretty much don't even need a management, you need an advisor people that can advise you the right thing. I mean, I had some guys that, that spoke to me about different things, but, um, you know, as a fighter, I mean, people, you know, you, 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 you get a bit weary when you get ripped off the first time. But um, you have to try and learn these things and see these cooks um, coming. Um, so, um, I mean, to be honest, as a fighter, you don't need any management. You can do it yourself. You can yeah. get advisors. I mean, shucks, you can give me a call. I'll, give you the best advice you'll ever need. I know everything about the game, <laughs> you know? And so do you have um, some of the fighters? Because I know um, people like Kai, Tuivasa, and even um, Carlos, who's just come into the UFC. Um, I remember they used to like help you prepare for fights and stuff like that. Do they ever come to you for um, um, advice now that they're in the UFC? You know, my door has always been open for these guys because I understand what it's like. I mean, I might have made a lot of bad business decisions and got ripped off a lot of time of bad business, uh, business but, with, but with contracts and companies, you know, all you need is just someone to advise you. Mm. You don't need no management taking from you, you know, um, unless they're going to be, you know, giving you sponsorship money, looking after you, you know, you don't need it, to be honest. You can do it yourself, but you just need to use advisors, to be honest. And I spoke to Ben the other day. I said, you know, you know, give me a call if you need some help. I mean, um, even lost all the boys that, that I, I have worked with, Justin Junior, all the boys, but they know my door's open. They always give me a call. So, what does life after professional um, fighting look like for you? <laughs> Gaming and um, a lot of my um, spending a lot of time with my beautiful kids. I um, you know, I spend a lot of time gaming. I spend a lot of time. I've just started back to training to get a bit healthier. Um, you know, I've got a couple of offers, which is crazy. <laughs> a couple of offers to fight. So, you know, even though I'm 47, I, I am, you know, if the offer's right, I might do it again because, you know, financial is just kind of draining these lawsuits. But, um, yeah, so I spend a lot of time with my beautiful kids and um, I was eating a lot of uh, cheesecakes through Christmas <laughs> because, because it's the holiday season and... Um, and I just, you know, I just, um, you know, I mean, Bam asked me to come over and train and score his next fight, but I'm like, I, you know, I love you, brother, but, um, you know, I've, I've done that for years, but, you know, you know the end goal, your end goal, and, and my end goal is different, and the end goal now, and I've seen that end goal, it's not worth it, it's not worth it, so, you know, chasing titles that can't hold your pants up, you know, it's, it's a waste of time, I'd rather spend it with my children and, um, you know, and, and raise them. I missed a lot of my, my kids growing up lives, you know, I mean, because I chased uh, a better, because uh, I wanted a better life, but like, for these kids. Oh, that's awesome. So they're like your happy place. Yeah. Um, what, and what was the reaction from your family and friends when they got to see the doco? Have, have any of them given you some feedback? Um, it's been really good. It's been pretty positive. Um, I mean, a lot of the people that went, that, that, that went, know me personally you know i grew up a lot with a lot of those guys um you know all good feedback um family my we watched it here at my house before it was released out there and then you know the kids they just see dad as dad and um, that's just how it is but um yeah the feedback was pretty good um it was actually really good from everyone so 
you know, hopefully uh, NZ enjoys the doco and we can all learn of each other and grow. Thank you. All the best with your case.